Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Starfield. My name is Camel. Today, I have a video for Bethesda Game Studios directly. This one's for you, BGS. I will do my best to not beat around the bush, while at the same time, I hope to be amicable and provide constructive feedback and solutions to problematic aspects of the game. I've enjoyed a fair bit of Starfield, but the want to play is waning. Starfield is not terrible by any means, but it's also not amazing. It has some really cool things in it, but also a fair whack of not so cool things. I find the more I play, the less I want to play. Which, for a mainline BGS game, this is a unique experience for me. There are many reasons for this, however not all of these reasons are realistically fixable. For example, asking for 30 new factions, that would be lovely, but obviously that is not a realistic request. So this video isn't so much about what is wrong with Starfield, but more specifically about features within the game that can either be changed, added or removed realistically. Things that a Bethesda Game Studios developer could take on board and go, yeah, I can make that change. I have spent the better part of the last five weeks with my community trying to pinpoint our problems with Starfield and come up with elegant and I hope simple ways to improve upon them. With that said, at the end of the video I do indulge in a really good rant with some shocking stats that I'm sure you'll be very interested to see so stick around for that. Now, to be completely fair to all game developers out there, I feel a disclaimer on my part is needed. I am not a game developer. I have not academically studied game development. I have never tried to develop a game. I am aware that there are plenty of unforeseen challenges and limiting factors during a game's development that the audience never sees, understands, or is aware of. So I could very well be spruiking out of my backside here. I could be the fact blokes slumped on the sofa gulping down Bud Light and yelling at the football team on the TV about the play that they should have made. I acknowledge that everything I suggest could come from a place of ignorance. But what I do know is that I have been obsessed with Bethesda Game Studios games for the last two decades. So much so that discussing every inch of BGS games has been my full-time job for the last nine or so years here on YouTube. I know what I love about Bethesda Game Studios games, I know what makes them special to me, and I know which of these fundamental ingredients are missing from Starfield's recipe. If Bethesda Game Studios wants Starfield to be a game that is played for the next decade, then they need to implement a whole lot of changes, because as it stands now, roughly two and a half months after Starfield's release, I don't really want to play the game, let alone for the next 10 years. I believe this is due to my pizza theory, but we'll bite into that doughy slice later on. Now before we get started, two things. Firstly, if you have anything to add, please jump into the conversation down below in the comments. I would love to hear your ideas and thoughts. And secondly, as a game consumer, I believe there are some golden rules to be followed when it comes to making a game. Ultimately, I will be approaching most of the topics in this video with the following rule set in mind. Firstly, fun. Is it fun? Secondly, time. Is it making good use of the player's time? Thirdly, flow. Does it bolster or interrupt the flow of gameplay? Fourthly, reward. Is the player being rewarded properly in-game for playing the game? Fifthly, quality of life. Is the experience user-friendly? And sixthly, if that's a word, hooks. Does it keep the player playing the game? Does it keep the player hooked? So these are easy, simple tenets. Well, with these rules for a good game in mind, and with topics in no particular order, let's try and fix Starfield. Save files. As someone who makes content on video games, saving at key moments and being able to easily reload back to them, it's very important. And as the save file system currently sits in Starfield, I have no clue where any particular save is. We cannot give them custom names and they don't have thumbnails as a reference point. There is some metadata like the name of the planet and the time of the save, but these do not help me differentiate between hundreds of save files. And really weirdly, this is a step backwards with both feet in two directions. As Fallout 4 had save file thumbnails, 
Skyrim had save file thumbnails. Fallout 3 had save file thumbnails. Oblivion had save file thumbnails. Morrowind had save file thumbnails and you could name the saves. Redguard had save file thumbnails and you could name the saves. Battlespire had save file thumbnails and you could name the save. Daggerfall had save file thumbnails and you could name the save. And even all the way back in 1994 with Arena, you could name your save files. So Bethesda, why are we going backwards here? When I make a save in Starfield at an important point or location, I have to log it in a physical notepad on my desk and write down the time, date and location of the save file with information telling me what that save file is. So when I need to find a specific save file, I have to reference a handwritten index in a paper notepad in real life. It is, for lack of a better phrase, ludicrous. It is a problem with a very simple fix. That fix, uh, just copy your old games, save file thumbnails, and perhaps custom save file names. So if that could be fixed up, I would appreciate that greatly. Flashlight. The flashlight in Starfield has been a headache for me personally, as it barely lights up a quarter of the screen, perhaps even less than a quarter of the screen. Producing an optical experience as if I were looking through a long, thin tube, which after a minute or two begins to induce wooziness. Now, I don't suffer from any kind of motion sickness in real life, but running around in a dark cave with the flashlight in Starfield makes me feel rather ill and rather quickly. Not only that, but even if it doesn't make a player feel sick, just mechanically the flashlight is next to useless. So I would absolutely adore it if there were a way to improve or upgrade the flashlight so that it actually illuminates everything on the screen, rather than spattering a piddly fart of flaccid photons into the ebon darkness before me. I mean, honestly, closing my eyes provides a better view of the cave ahead. Vanta Black is brighter than this flashlight. You know when you start an MMO and you cannot wait to replace your one damage rusty dagger starter weapon? Well, that's how I feel about the flashlight. I would love the flashlight in Starfield to be akin to the Pip-Boy light in Fallout 4, where when toggled on, it simply, effectively, and most importantly, helpfully lights up everything on the screen so that we, the player, can actually see. It doesn't light up some of the screen, it lights up all of the screen. Are we truly meant to believe that post-apocalyptic trash can world has better lighting technology than futuristic spacefaring humans who have mastered intergalactic space travel? Hmm, I don't think so. Okay, so I have a few solutions for upgrading the flashlight. Firstly, is making a flashlight modification slot on all helmets, where you can add different strength flashlights to provide more light, ultimately landing on something like what we had in Fallout 4. Another idea is to have the strength of the flashlight increase passively with the ranks of a skill, such as scanning. The higher the scanning skill, the more powerful and broad the flashlight becomes. Or a third option would be to just make it a toggleable setting and easy access for all. Or even fourthly, just simply change it once and for all to make everyone's flashlight bigger and better as the default setting. Whatever path is chosen, all I ask is that we can get a flashlight worth using. After starting the game and bumping my way through Vectera Mine, no thanks to the diet water equivalent of a flashlight, I then spent my first hour or so in New Atlantis trying to hunt down the merchant or crafting table that would allow me to boost the power of my flashlight. Of course, this salvation did not exist, does not exist still. So, Bethesda, I am asking you to add this salvation, please, and make the flashlight a friend that we welcome into our gameplay, instead of making me avoid in-game areas that are dark and require me to use the flashlight because at the moment, it's just not that player-friendly. Waiting. 
Waiting in Starfield is painfully glacial. It feels unnecessarily time-consuming. Waiting in Starfield is quite the handbrake on the flow of gameplay, holding onto our time in the worst way. I don't know if there is a reason for waiting being this slow, but it does appear to be a speed preset by Bethesda, as we'll see in a minute. I would love if we had the option to skip the actual wait time and just be done with it immediately, or at least significantly faster. To play Devil's Advocate, one might want to pass time in-game until a particular moment, like sunrise, and the slow hour by hour passing gives you time to react to that moment occurring in game. But apart from that, I cannot think of any reason a player would want the wait function to come along slower than the PC port for the Elder Scrolls Blades. And we are going to bring Blades to every device and system we can, PCs, consoles. Here I am still patiently waiting. But I would like this time wasting to be removed entirely and to be given the ability to just wait anywhere, anytime, much like in Skyrim. This is what waiting in Starfield looks like in real time. Step one, find somewhere to wait. Something to report? Step two, sit down. Step three. Watch the hours clunk by, moving slower than a BGS development cycle. Stare at the nothingness on the game screen and think about your life decisions. Don't worry, you have plenty of time for it. Step four, wake up in real life to watch a standing up animation in game. And step five, go back to what you were doing in the first place. That whole process took one minute and 20 seconds. The wait time alone took 53 seconds. It's five different layers of unnecessary time chewing that is not fun and it interrupts game flow. Now, both Skyrim's and Fallout 4's wait times pass literally twice as fast. So why is it so slow in Starfield? Well, interestingly, we can actually change the speed at which wait time passes in-game in Starfield with a console command, as if we type set GS space I seconds to sleep per update space 20,000 and then click enter, well, now when we wait in game, an entire 24 hours passes in a matter of seven and a half seconds. And the game runs fine and dandy. Nothing's crashed, nothing's gone weird. So the only limiting factor holding back us having fast wait time in Starfield, well, it's Bethesda. For whatever reason, they have set the amount of time it takes for 24 hours to pass at some value that makes it take 53 seconds. Why? I don't know. And with all this in mind, here is what I want waiting in Starfield to look like. Just out here in the middle of nowhere, none of that pesky furniture needed. Just let me wait 24 hours and in a couple of seconds, it's done and you can get back to whatever it is you were doing. To me, at least, it's clearer than a high ranking Scientologist. Which of these waiting functions provides a better quality of life experience and respects the player's time? So please Bethesda, let us wait anywhere, whenever we want, and most importantly, have the timer move much, much faster, as so that we can get on with actually playing the game. Maps. I don't think I need to explain this, but in just about every game ever that's explorable, maps are a staple component of the game, as so that you know where you are going and what's around you. 
while the maps currently in Starfield well, might as well not exist. When you open the surface map, it's so minimalistic it's almost hard to read what it's trying to tell you. Now in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, the world map is rendered in real time based on what is happening in the game world. Well here, 12 years later in Starfield, is there not a way to have the surface map be a real time render of the randomly generated landscapes? The game knows what the terrain looks like and provides low quality renders of distant objects and surrounding topography. So the game has already rendered a 3D model of the exact layout of the region that the player is in. Why can it not just take that terrain data and render a miniature version of our surroundings as the surface map, just like in Skyrim? At least it would look a lot nicer than the ultra basic blue grid we have currently. Another point that needs to be tweaked somewhat is the cardinal directions. Cardinal being north, south, east and west. Firstly, on the surface map, it would be nice if the direction in which the player character is facing was more clearly defined. At the moment, this small, slightly highlighted cone isn't as punctual as it should be. Secondly, the compass in the bottom left of the heads up display does not make it swiftly clear as to which direction my character is facing. I know from some testing that this larger marker is the north indicator, but I would like to see even just some letters added so I can glance at the compass and in half a second know which way I am facing. As it sits currently, I need to study the compass for a few seconds to figure out what it's trying to tell me. So both in the surface map and the HUD compass, I would like to see more visual punctuality added. And while we're on the topic of the HUD and the compass in the bottom left of the screen, well, let us not forget that this is the face of our Chronomark watch given to us by Barrett at the start of the game. You know, the same watch that you can get in real life if you got the collector's edition of Starfield. Well, this Chronomark watch, it tells us our location, the current day night phase, the cardinal directions, it shows locations and quest markers, it has an O2 meter, it tells us the enemies nearby, along with the hazards and conditions of the environment. It also shows us the current temperature of our surroundings, along with the O2 percentage of the atmosphere and the gravity of the planet slash moon that we are on. It seems to tell us absolutely everything except the time. Call me crazy. But I think that it just might be worth adding the time to the Chronomark watch. And it even tells the time. <laughs> City maps. So back to the maps, worst of all is the lack of local maps for cities and towns. Just a simple map of a city layout with building names or icons for different vendor types would be ever so helpful. As it stands, trying to get around some of the cities and towns is nothing short of perplexing and painful. When you get lost in real life, you open Google Maps and go, oh, there we are and there is the place we are trying to go. A map provides a five second solution to being lost. Well, if we get lost in one of Starfield's major cities, for some reason there are no in-game cartographic depictions of any location to help you get back on track or to provide an inkling of a clue as to where the hell anything is in these massive maze-like metropolises. Even the 2003 J2ME mobile game The Elder Scrolls Travels Stormhold, which has a file size of 163 kilobytes, which is smaller than most JPEGs, even this game has maps of the entire game. So in short, please Bethesda, give us city local maps. Thank you sincerely from every Starfield player. Star Maps. Now, onto the Star Map. What this needs is a search function in which we can type the name of any star system, any planet, moon, space station, space ship, or surface location, and it will bring up a list of matching results from which we can select the one we want and it will just open it on the map easily and quickly. 
rather than trudging through 100 star systems, trying to find a specific moon that we can't quite remember the location of. As it stands now, when I need to find a specific location in Starfields, do you know what I do? I minimize the game and Google the location name to then bring up a third party website to show me where the location is found in game. I personally don't think it's good when players need to literally take themselves out of a game to progress within the game. This could very easily be rectified by a simple search function in the star map. Even the Elder Scrolls 2 Daggerfall had a search function in its map. Again, it seems we are going backwards. Now, along with a search function, I would love it if there was an option to always display all star system names, as so that we do not have to mouse over 50 unlabeled star systems looking for a specific one. If the names were on screen all the time and they were color coded to reflect their level range, this wouldn't be a problem and it would make identifying a specific star system within the star map quick and easy work. It would take seconds, opposed to what can sometimes take minutes currently in game. Bestiary. Now you will get to see tens upon tens of hours of Photoshop pain that I went through for you in just a few minutes. So. Starfield has hundreds of alien creatures, alien plant life, and tons of resources. Discovering them can be quite fun, but trying to remember where things are is just about impossible. So I would love to see the introduction of a bestiary slash glossary slash index slash encyclopedia slash database slash collections Call it whatever you like, I will just refer to it as the bestiary. So, this bestiary would log the locations and stats of all of the fauna, flora, and resources that you have found throughout your playthrough. And while a bestiary would be a wonderful, almost log book like index of everything you have discovered, it would also be very handy in so many ways. For example, let's say that you need to get some copper. Well, with the bestiary, you can go to the resources tab and then go through the entries of all discovered resources until we reach copper. Then we select copper and this will then provide a list of all the planets and moons that we have discovered that have copper. It will also show us how many light years away each one is so that we can choose which is closest. And then we simply select one of the locations which will open that planet on the map, which will skip searching through the star map menu so that we can quickly be on our way to gathering copper instead of what it is currently, where we have to sit there trying to remember where we found copper and then spending five minutes trudging through the star map, opening and closing star systems, hovering over moons and planets individually, trying to find some place that we've already discovered. And this handiness of the bestiary would go for all of the fauna and flora too. For example, I found this Mike Wazowski looking creature. I thought it looked pretty funny, so I took some screenshots of it and went on my way. However, a few weeks later, I wanted to go and get footage of this alien for a video. But guess what? I don't know what the alien's called. I don't know what planet it was on. So even though I have already put in the hard work of discovering this alien, if I want to find it again, which I do, I quite literally have to rediscover it. And still six weeks later, I have not found this creature again. Ah, but a bestiary would eliminate this issue. Just imagine the image and name of every alien you've found, and you can select one which will open up a more in-depth stat page on the side that shows stats like health, attack damage, speed, height, weight, simple characteristics like this, along with, of course, also showing the locations where you have discovered that creature. Now, most of these game stats serve no real purpose, yet I want them. I would happily read through all of them, trying to find the fastest alien in Starfield or the smallest alien in Starfield or the heaviest, etc, etc. 
And if we really want to go deep, I suppose on top of this, each creature entry could also have the items that each creature can drop. Literally a loot table, so that you can see what creatures you have to kill to find those specific organic resources that you need for crafting. Or perhaps just like the stats, you can flick through pages of aliens comparing their loot tables out of curiosity. I used to play World of Warcraft and I would spend hours upon hours going through Wowhead or Thoughtbot or something like that, looking at loot tables of all the random enemies in the game. And to be honest, I already do this for Starfield, but I don't do it in game because it doesn't exist in game. I have to use a website. Naturally, I would prefer to do this in game. The more information the game itself can give me about the game, the better. I want to do this stuff within Starfield. And I think that you would too, Bethesda, because it would keep players in the game. And as we mentioned, just like the resources, if you want to find that alien again, you simply go down to the location section and select from the list of locations where you've found said creature, which quickly and easily opens that location on the map so that you can be on your merry way. Of course, flora would act the same way as the resources and fauna as I've just described. Now we're not done yet, as on top of this, a bestiary acts like a sticker book. And people love filling sticker books. People love collecting stuff. And people love seeing the things they've collected side by side, just like a series of Pokemon cards. So given people love collecting stuff, especially in Bethesda Game Studios games, well, this would incentivize exploration. Think of the Pokedex from Pokemon. You want to catch them all, or at least discover them all. And seeing pages and pages of undiscovered Pokemon drives you to keep playing the game. And no, it's not the sole reason, but it is definitely a factor. The most recent game that I have played with a bestiary was Dredge. And while I do feel like I have finished the game, I am constantly drawn back to it because as you can see, I have not discovered all of the fish. Without the bestiary, I would just put the game down and consider it finished. But knowing there are still 50 or so undiscovered fish, it fills me with the need to find them all. Just like in set collections in the Elder Scrolls Online, there are hundreds, if not thousands of item sets that I couldn't care less about. I'm never gonna use them, but with the sticker book like formats, where you get an item once and it goes to your collections tab, I will actively go and seek out content in the game that I would otherwise never ever touch, just so I can fill the sticker book, just so I can collect them all. And I like it, it is fun collecting stuff. So not only would a bestiary be helpful, it would be an in-game recognition of you, the player's exploration efforts. And because of this, it may just work as a mechanism to draw players back into the game. At the moment, discovering stuff in Starfield is kind of eh. It's kind of fun, sure, but there's no payback for it. But discovering stuff to fill a sticker book, now this would make me explore every single planet and moon in the game. I'm 100% serious. I would 100% fill that sticker book. And just to brush away some doubt, there may be a small number of you that will say that a bestiary could take the sense of the unknown out of the game, as having a displayed maximum number to be discovered would inform you of how many creatures are in the game. Well, a very simple fix for this would be to have the bestiary completely blank, and it only shows entries that you have discovered. This way, you'll never quite be sure if there is still something out there or not. Now, with all of this in mind, a bestiary would also add a sense of completionist competition amongst fellow Starfield players and friends. You talk to your mate and he says, I've discovered 512 creatures in the bestiary. You, as a fellow bestiary fiend, will have either found more or less than he has. Suddenly, whoever has found fewer is driven to beat their friend. It creates a sense of friendly competition within a single player game. An example of this is in the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind, in which 
every time you did a quest or any kind of quest update, it would fill some text in your journal. So generally, the more pages that are filled in your journal, the more you've played the game, the more stuff you've done in Morrowind. So my neighbor and I, we had a friendly competition where we were constantly comparing who had more journal pages than the other. Well, in this same way, I think the bestiary would act just like that. Now, on top of this, the bestiary could also be worked into the in-game reward system, but we will talk more on that later on, as that is its own topic. But, as you can see, adding a bestiary slash glossary slash index slash encyclopedia slash database slash collection, whatever you want to call it, it has many perks and would be a very welcome addition to the game. Unique Creatures Now, while Starfield does have a wide array of weird and wacky creatures, it could be complemented further with the addition of some secret, hidden, one-off unique creature encounters. Maybe they drop unique items or drop display trophies that you can place in your outposts. Something a little extra to make them special. Such things could easily be in the game waiting to be found, but if they are, I am unaware of them. And if they're not in the game, well, I believe some unique creatures would be an excellent little surprise for players to discover. And again, the possibility of discovering such a thing would draw players to exploring the game, aka play the game more. And while we're on the topic of creatures, making some already existing alien creatures in Starfield tameable would be a cool little addition. Just as we have dog meat in the Fallout series, it might be interesting to have a little green alien puppy by your side in Starfield. Digi picking. Ah, Bethesda, you need to ensure that all locked objects contain a rarity of loot reflecting the difficulty of the lock. I have opened far too many master level locks only to find literally nothing inside, after spending a minute or two unlocking it. That is a gaming sin, holding onto the player's time for no reason and failing to reward the player for playing the game. On top of this, at the moment, an increase in lock difficulty seems to be synonymous with an increase in the time it takes to open said lock. I would much prefer a system in which the harder locks are more challenging to open, but can be done in about the same time as any other lower level lock. For example, in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, I could open a master level lock at just about the same speed as any other level lock. I just have to pay closer attention to it while I'm doing it. And that's fine, that's good. But as it sits in Starfield, I find for every increase in lock level, it's a guaranteed addition of 10, 20, 30 seconds to the time required to open said lock, which I find gets in the way of game flow. I'm at a point in Starfield where if I find a collection of locked containers, I will just walk past them as I don't want to spend the next three, four, five or so minutes digi-picking a bunch of boxes for minimal or even no loot. And on top of this, I would also love it if Bethesda Game Studios dramatically boosted the experience gained from successfully opening a lock. I can go and kill an alien in a few seconds and get 100 or so experience, but I can also spend three minutes digi-picking a master level lock only to receive 20 experience. Now that does not seem balanced to me, because it is not. Experience gains should be more linked to the effort and time put into something, but we will talk about an experience rebalance later on. Interacting with the scanner up. For whatever reason, at the moment in Starfield, when you have the scanner up, which I do most of the time so I can see what's actually going on, you can not interact with some things, but you can interact with some other things. For example, you cannot interact with harvestable inorganic resources, such as gas nodes like a chlorine vent or a body of liquid, such as a pool of water. Nor can you interact with doors or containers that have an opening animation, such as lockers or even just doors to enter rooms or buildings. You are also unable to interact with any locked object Therefore, you cannot enter the digi-picking minigame with the scanner up. You are also unable to use Starborn powers 
and the stealth indicator will not show up on screen while the scanner is active. However, with the scanner up, you can harvest organic resources from plants, along with loot bodies and access unlocked containers. So obviously having so many basic game interactions disabled while the scanner is up needs to be fixed pronto. As it stands, there is no rhyme or reason to any of it. You can do some things, but you cannot do other things. You can pick plants, but you cannot pick up gas. So the scanner and its related coding need a good thorough ironing out because currently it's a confusing kick to the ghoulies of Gameflow. Visual cue for harvested resources. So while we're on the topic of the scanner, when you harvest mineable resources like iron, well, the node is destroyed. Therefore, you know that you've collected said resource because it's gone. However, when it comes to gases and liquids, once these resource nodes have been harvested, while the scanner is up, there is no visual indicator that they have been depleted. As before harvesting them, they glow blue. And after harvesting them, they glow blue. I think that it would be a sensible addition if harvested nodes glowed a different color within the scanner, like red. This way, if I see blue, I know I should spend my time traveling to said node to collect its resource. And if I see red, I know I should not spend my time traveling to it because it's already been depleted. Very simple, very handy. Inventory. Now let's move on to some topics in regards to the inventory. Firstly, is a keyring. When it comes to the inventory categories, I would love to see a keyring slash keycard tab added, as so that when I go to find a miscellaneous item in my inventory, I do not have to sift through 150 undroppable keycards, just to give this horde of pesky yet useful access items a nice, quiet category of their own that I will never ever have to interact with or deal with again. World of Warcraft used to have a keyring tab for all the various keys you collected in game, and it was great. I would love to see this added into Starfield to get those key cards out of our way, out of our miscellaneous tab and just off in their own little tab. Aid and food. I would also like to see the aid category be named consumables, which would then have two subcategories, which would be food and aid. As so actual aid items and actual food items have their own tabs. There are tons of different aid items and tons of different food items. And frankly, having so many items crammed into one long list can be an absolute pain to navigate, especially as they serve different purposes. You're either looking for an aid item or looking for a food item, but to look for either, you must scroll through both categories in one giant jumbled list. So separating aid and food from one another into their own sub tabs would be a welcome change. Books, data slates, magazines, and notes. In a similar fashion, I would like to see the notes category have four sub tabs. As at the moment in the notes tab, we have books, data slates, magazines, and notes, i.e. pieces of paper. If I'm looking for a book or a specific data slate, I don't want this process to take four times as long as it should slash could, because four different types of items are all dumped into the one notes tab. If it was split up, however, if I'm looking for magazines, I just select the magazine tab and there are all the magazines. Easy peasy, clean, and most importantly, fast. Search function. Now, along with these changes to make traversing the inventory easier, an absolute godsend, much like for the star map, would be a search function within the player inventory and other containers, such as the player storage or our ship's cargo hold, especially for a player's chosen repository, like the infinite capacity safe in our bedroom at the lodge or the other crates downstairs, which currently house every item that I've ever picked up in game. So having a search function to quickly and effortlessly find the item that I'm looking for would be much preferred to the current state of things 
where I have to monotonously hold down the old thumbstick for a few minutes while I watch millions of items trickle past and the scroll bar budge less than Vasco in a corridor. Drop all. As you may know, there is a drop all slash pick up all option in certain inventory categories, such as resources. This is very handy and a feature that I like a lot. So I would love to see this option made available for all item categories, being able to drop or pick up all of my miscellaneous items, all of my books and data slates, all of my aid items and foodstuffs, all of my weapons, apparel, helmets, boost packs, spacesuits, throwables, with the quick click of a single button would be heavenly and save us players a whole lot of time faffing around, dropping and picking up singular items. Connecting player storage with crafting tables. And when it comes to player storage, one aspect that I'm torn in twain about is the battle between realism and quality of life. Specifically, the notion of connecting all player storage with all crafting tables. It might come across as making the game too easy, but honestly, after running megatons of crafting materials back and forth between my ship, my outposts, my player storage containers, and crafting tables, along with trying to figure out where I placed what resource or crafting item, it's just a massive drag on game flow. I would love to see this quality of life change and just make it easy and quick for players to craft what they want to craft, wherever they are and wherever their resources are. Instead of having to play hide and go seek for 30 minutes with a stack of misplaced iron ore, before eventually locating them and hauling them to the nearest workbench to then finally get started on the crafting that you set out to do 30 minutes ago. And if a simple change like this feels too easy, perhaps implement something unlockable that allows this. For example, if you have all of the crafting and outpost skills maxed out, you can then build something law friendly. Let's call it a, a grav safe that harnesses gravity technology to provide infinite storage and that links to all crafting tables in the game. This way it is still obtainable, but there is effort and time required to gain it, along with a sense of I earned this. Scrapping items. Now, while we're on the topic of crafting, I loved the scrapping system implemented in Fallout 4, as it suddenly transformed hundreds of useless junk and miscellaneous items into valuable and sometimes sought after little bundles of important crafting resources. I thought this system was a brilliant idea and I was very excited to see it added to all of Bethesda Game Studios future games. Well, I was very surprised to find this very clever and useful junk scrapping feature of Fallout 4 to be entirely absent from Starfield. Much like my search to upgrade the flashlight, I spent hours searching for the crafting table that would allow me to scrap all of the junk items that I painstakingly gathered from the opening hours of the game, lugging hundreds of kilograms of stuff back to the frontier, loading up Vasco with items, walking around over encumbered, all so that I could scrap it all and get a whole bunch of crafting materials once I got to New Atlantis. You can imagine my disappointment. Now the Fallout 4 scrapping system is so brilliant and useful that it did not even cross my mind that this system would not be in Starfield. Hell, I think they should add it to the Elder Scrolls 6. Turn all those buckets and cauldrons into little packages of usable crafting resources. Now as far as I can tell, there are no downsides to adding this recycling mechanic into the game, or any game, as all it does is make useless items useful. It makes every location a treasure trove of clutter, so I would love to see them add this truly S-tier crafting system into Starfield. To go along with this, it might be nice to see an option within the inventory to mark items as junk, and then we can simply go to a workbench and scrap all junk, or go to a vendor and sell all junk, which would hopefully make dealing with merchants a much faster process mitigating us from having to battle with our inventory. Food and aid crafting. Now when it comes to food and aid item crafting in Starfield, I found it to be quite shallow and disappointing. 
I saved up tens of levels worth of skill points so that I could max out all of the crafting skills at once, which I did. And after doing so, I realized that nothing in the food or aid crafting system is really worth my time to ever look at again. Now, I don't mind if food and aid crafting systems in a game aren't particularly great or deep, but when you need to spend multiple skill points to unlock it all, only to be met by a lackluster system with limited options, that, I feel, is not fair to the player's time and effort. For example, Skyrim's cooking system wasn't very deep, and that's fine, because you can access all it has to offer from level 1 at any time. It requires no investment of your skill points. But if, like in Starfield, Skyrim had a cooking skill tree and required you to permanently invest a bunch of skill points to fully unlock all of the cooking options, and those options were as limited as they are in Skyrim, that would, once again, just like in Starfield, be an injustice to the player's time and efforts. So these systems need a lot more love if its skill investment is to be justified. Unlockable appearance options. Now, while we're talking about crafting, you may have noticed that most weapons and armor have a crafting slot at the bottom for skins. Now, as far as I am aware, there are currently only seven applicable skins in game, all of which come from pre-purchase bonuses. Now, unique items with unique appearances do actually have their texture applied through the skin tab, but the crafting option is locked and cannot be changed, which in my opinion is good. But the point of this, to my knowledge, there are no ways within the game to unlock new skins slash appearances to be used through this crafting option. So. I would like to see skins for weapons and armors implemented as unlockable rewards for achieving certain goals within the game. For example, in the Elder Scrolls Online, you can customize the color of your weapons and armor as you please through the dying system, but most of the colors available in-game have to be unlocked by completing certain tasks slash in-game achievements. This is one of the simple gaming tenets in-game rewards for playing the game. Two benefits would come from adding a system like this. Firstly, the player can unlock a wide range of customization options for their weapons and armor. And secondly, much like the bestiary that we proposed earlier on in the video, adding any sort of collections list will have players playing the game more and being rewarded in-game for it. Now, given that Starfield already has the stats tracking menu in game, this could easily be used as the foundation to not only track character stats, but have milestones within those stats, which when met will unlock a color option or appearance for weapons and armor. For example, if you fully scan 100 planets, good job, you've unlocked the blue armor option. Or kill 1000 enemies, you've unlocked red, scan 100 aliens, you unlock purple, etc, etc. This in my mind would be very simple to implement and would be very rewarding for players. Adding modifiers. Now this next point could be considered contentious but I find the time gambling legendary weapon and armor system unfit for a single player RPG like Starfield. Something like Destiny 2, sure, in which you were competing with other players, the more time you put in, the better chance you have at getting a good weapon, that's fine. But having an MMO RNG loot grind system in a single player game like Starfield feels wholly inappropriate to the players and their time. Grinding legendary enemy spawn points for tens of hours trying to get a really good drop with the right modifiers, I do not find that fun. And it's not guaranteed, which means it is time gambling, which does not belong in a single player game at all. Currently, the legendary item model in Starfield plagues the weapons and armors in-game with the same soullessness as exploration, which we will get very deep into later. The environments are procedurally generated, and so are the items. It's the same problem. 
Instead of being handcrafted and special, it feels robotic and random because it is random. I would like to see this removed, but I'm sure they will not do that. For this reason, I would love to see a way for players to unlock access to modifiers that they can then apply to their weapons and armor. The system that I'm proposing is just about identical to the enchanting system in Skyrim. You find an item which has a certain enchantment. You disenchant that item which destroys it. But your character has now unlocked the ability to add that enchantment to other items via the enchanting skill perks and system. This way, every character still has to go out and collect hundreds of items with different effects, but ultimately, after some hard work and investment of time and skill points and such, it will lead to the player having some control over the modifiers on their gear, instead of how it currently is, which relies solely on random number generation, i.e. bad. Item Tier Crafting Now this next point bleeds more heavily into the following points about unique items, which naturally we will get into in a minute or three. But for now, in Starfield, there are different tiers of weapons and armor. For weapons, there is Tier 1, this is the basic tier with no name additive. Tier 2 is calibrated, Tier 3 is refined, and Tier 4 is advanced. And for armor, there is tier 1, the basic tier with no name additive, tier 2, calibrated, tier 3, refined, tier 4, advanced, and tier 5, superior. Now, the higher the item's tier, the better the item's stats. So not only do you need to get a piece of gear with the right modifiers, but it also needs to be the highest tier. Otherwise, it will not be able to compete with items that are of a higher tier. Which translates to you will sell 99% of the items you get because they're useless to you. Now just like modifiers, this system leaves players relying solely on a time gambling mechanic for their items, in which all we can do is hope and pray that a usable version of an item that we actually want drops. Now to sound exactly like a broken record, I want to see some form of player control over this unnecessary tier system when it comes to gear. The simplest, and in my opinion the best, solution is to add item tiers as a crafting slot. In the same way we can change the magazine capacity of a gun, we should be able to change an item's tier with crafting. Of course, the higher the tier, the higher the relevant crafting skill needs to be, the more demanding the research to unlock it, the rarer and more expensive the crafting materials, etc, etc. Or perhaps just like enchanting slash disenchanting system that we proposed a little bit earlier, you find an item of a certain tier, you can disenchant it, destroy it, but your character has now unlocked the ability to add that tier to that item type via crafting. This will give players something to work towards, and more importantly, give players control over the quality of their gear. Cleaning Item Names Now while we are in the realm of discussing item modifiers and tiers, I would love a cleaner naming system, as at the minute we have the name of the base item combined with the name of the tier, combined with the name or names of the modifiers combined with the crafting modifications applied. This results in what I consider to be a very messy and orderless inventory that is difficult to navigate and, to be frank, a little bit ridiculous. Much like this thing, the Space Adept, Professionals, Advanced, Nova Light. Is it Professional? Is it Advanced? Is it Adept? It's all three, <laughs> okay? Now, of course, the inventory search function we touched on earlier would be a great help here with this scrappy naming system, but I would also like to see just a bit of refining done here. For example, if we move the item tier keyword from the item name and into the item's information box, maybe. And along with this, I would like to see all of the item modification keywords that are added into the item's display name 
Well, I'd like to see them always come after the name of the actual weapon. As the game currently sits, it's just about Scrabble Chaos. If I want to find all of my Grendels, for example, I need to scroll all over the place, reading each and every name of everything to see if Grendel is lost in there somewhere. It is very messy and much more time consuming than I would like it to be. So always have the base weapon name first and move tier name into the information window, or perhaps we could replace these names with symbols. For example, a symbol to represent the item tier and symbols to represent the modifiers. Like if it does some fire damage, there's a fire symbol. If it does radiation damage, there's a radiation symbol. If it does poison damage, there's a poison symbol. I don't really mind how it's done. I just think the item naming should be cleaned up a fair bit. Unique items. Now we will move on to unique items where we have several very important aspects to discuss. Firstly, why are unique items important? Well, unique items are near and dear to me personally, so I may be biased, but I spent years combing Morrowind looking for every single unique item in the game to collect them all and display them proudly in my Redoran stronghold. I feel that most of the unique items in Morrowind had fitting challenges to be bested to acquire them, and they were found in hidden dungeons or behind weird quests. A fair chunk of them had S tier stats, most had unique appearances and cool backstories. To this day, I still think of unique items with this same nostalgic twinkle in my eye. In fact, I love unique items within Bethesda Game Studios games so much that I literally turned talking about them into a full-time job. And based on the community engagement with the content that I made on unique items, all of your players love unique items too. So I still hold unique items in Bethesda Game Studios games with these high standards of what they used to represent. Now, before you ask, I will explain the simple components to making unique items a special part of any game. Firstly is unique appearance. It stands out, it looks cool. Unique name, it sounds cool and is memorable slash recognizable. Unique effects, it can do things that no other item can do. Unique backstory, a piece of lore that gives it a place within the game universe. Competitive stats, so it remains usable throughout the course of the game. And finally, interesting acquisition. Basically, anything apart from sold by a vendor. So, with this in mind, I think it's fair to say that most of the unique items in Starfield fall very short of these simple rules. The bulk majority of unique items in Starfield don't have unique appearances. They do have unique names, so good on you. But they don't have unique effects, they don't have unique backstories, some do, most of them don't, and they don't have competitive stats. And it's about 50-50 in regards to the interesting acquisition, as there's a whole bunch of unique items sold by vendors. I mean, if there was one unique item sold by a vendor and when you went to buy it, the guy was like, yeah, just so you know, like someone came in here and sold it to me they couldn't wait to get rid of it because they said it was cursed Ugh. and then you buy it from the vendor and then like some weird quest happens in that way a vendor selling it could be fitting but having like every major vendor in every city sell a unique item oh no 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 anyway needless to say that starfield's selection of unique items have missed the mark and at the very least they have let this starfield player down but let's look forward and talk about our options for improving the dire state we find these poor, poor, unique items in. Firstly, all unique items should be some of the best gear available in-game and be a viable option for extended use if one so pleases. This is not the case in Starfield currently, as most unique items in the game do not have competitive stats and their item tier is usually tier one, AKA the crappiest possible variant. For example, I got the unique Grendel, Acid Rain. It's got a cool unique appearance. It's got a cool name. It's got an effect that reflects the name, but its stats are on par with the tier one Grendel, the worst possible variant. So even though I went and got this cool unique item, 
the second I got my hands on it, it is completely unusable in game. Why? Because its item tier is tier one, the worst possible variant. So this means that the second you find anything higher than tier one, that unique item is now obsolete and will be thrown into the lightless void of your player storage, never to be seen or thought of again. This issue is easily fixed with the tier crafting system that we proposed earlier. This way you can upgrade the tier of unique items, giving them competitive stats and longevity in your playthrough. Alternatively, all unique items could just drop as the highest possible tier. I don't really mind how this tier upgrading feature is implemented, I only care that it is implemented and swiftly as to breathe life into the alarming number of unusable and undercooked unique items. Four effects. Now to go along with all of this fixing unique items, I think that all unique items should have four effects or modifiers. Bear with me, it'll make sense in a second. So when it comes to resources, we have varying rarities which are visually represented with a different amount of colored diamonds on the nameplate. We have common, which is gray and has no diamonds. We have uncommon, which is blue and has one diamond. We have rare, which is purple and has two diamonds. We have exotic, which is golden and has three diamonds. And finally, we have unique, which is green and has four diamonds. Now, when it comes to weapons and armor, there are currently four rarities, which you will notice follow the same pattern as the resources. As we have common, which is gray with no stars. We have rare, which is blue with one star. We have epic, which is purple with two stars. And we have legendary, which is golden with three stars. Now the amount of stars present on the item's nameplate directly correspond with how many modifiers that item has. Gray, common, no stars, no modifiers. Blue, rare, one star, one modifier. Purple, epic, two stars, two modifiers. Golden, legendary, three stars, three modifiers. But for some silly reason, unlike resources, there is not a higher rarity class for unique weapons and armor. To me, it's obvious that there needs to be a unique rarity tag for, would you believe it, unique items. And it would work exactly the same way as the unique rarity system that the devs have already created and half implemented. Unique weapons and armor would have green as their color indicator and they would have four stars on the nameplate as the rarity indicator, which of course would translate to all unique items in game having four modifiers to match their four stars, just as they deserve. As we clarified earlier, unique items should be among the best items in game, which they would have a much better chance of being if they all had an extra fourth modifier, making them slightly more desirable than random legendary drops. And having this green rarity tag would also allow players to instantly and easily know what is unique and what isn't unique, which in the game's current state I find very difficult, as all of the base weapons have cool names as if they were unique items, like the Beowulf, the Big Bang, things like that. Every time I picked up a weapon for the first time, I thought, oh, a unique item. Well, just turns out they named all the base items like unique items for some reason. And then the actual unique items have no unique indicators to inform us, the players, that they are in fact unique. It's very confusing. Other unique qualities. Now on top of this, it would be lovely to see unique items in Starfield get the love that I think they deserve and have unique appearances, unique modifiers, unique effects and abilities and interesting unique backstories and interesting ways of acquiring them. And as nice as all of these unique qualities would be, I do recognize that these are not a quick and easy change. Unlike the tier crafting and four modifier unique rarity as discussed above, but a man can dream. So an example of this is the Mantis armor set. It has a very unique and interesting backstory to it. The process of acquiring it 
is equally as interesting. The whole set has a unique appearance, so it stands out. However, the effects on the item are completely randomized. Ugh, no, no, no. The Mantis armor should have stats and effects that reflect the vigilante bounty hunter they represent. They are a part of the story, part of the legacy, and the reward for the player's efforts. Each piece should feel special and relevant to the Mantis and what the Mantis is, what the Mantis was. The stats and effects and modifiers and abilities, whatever you want to call them, on the pieces of Mantis armor should be set in stone and certainly, certainly not randomized. I was so disheartened when I learned that the pieces of the Mantis set have random stats just carelessly slapped on. Don't make any sense with the Mantis armor, what the Mantis got up to. Uh, it should be thought out and crafted with love and purpose. So I've created an example for us. This is Hella's Cutter. This is a unique item that you can acquire very easily. I do wish it had a slightly better acquisition method, but okay, whatever. Now in game, Hella's Cutter has one modifier, and that is Disassembler, which gives plus 20% damage against robots. This doesn't tell a story. It doesn't stand out. It doesn't mean anything. Hella is one of the miners that we first meet in Vectera Mines. The cutter is used for mining. Well, I mean, straight away, we've got two great starting places. With these two very simple plot pieces, Hella's cutter should look something like this. Firstly, green because it's unique. Give it four stars because it's unique. And give it four modifiers because it is unique. And those four modifiers should also be unique because it is unique. It needs to stand out. It needs to be special. So firstly is focused. It always fires at maximum power. Hmm, pretty good. Secondly is candle. Deals two times damage, but consumes charge twice as fast. Ah, it's good, but it's also potentially bad. Thirdly is Geologist. There's a 25% chance to harvest extra ore from mineable resources. Makes sense. And fourthly is Awesome. 10% chance for slain enemies to drop random ore on the ground. See how much better that feels? It's powerful, but it also has some drawbacks, potentially. It does double the damage, but it eats through the charge twice as fast. It makes you weigh it up a bit more, like is that good or is that going to be really bad? And then it's got some passives relevant to the backstory of the item. It's a cutter, a mining tool, and it was owned by a veteran miner, Hella. Therefore, it does some things involving ore and mining. Super simple. I thought these changes up in about 30 seconds. It took me about 20 minutes to do it in Photoshop, but the idea was instant. It, it made itself. What I've created here is very sadly more special and unique than literally any unique item currently in Starfield. It really irks me that the more funding BGS gets, the bigger and more experienced BGS gets, the fundamentals of what makes their games so good seems to deteriorate. Well, as sad as that truth is, I think that fixing unique items in the ways that I have proposed would be a lovely step back towards greatness. Ships. Now let's talk about ships. Firstly, shipbuilding is a lot of fun, and I have some easy tweaks to make it more enjoyable and provide an experience with a little more quality of life for players. Firstly is being able to take a tour of the interior of your ship while in the shipbuilding mode. It would be lovely. Currently as it stands, there is no function to inspect the interior layout of ship modules while in the ship builder. This can lead to some frustrating moments after spending many minutes, if not hours, and many hundreds of thousands of credits crafting your dream ship only to exit the shipbuilder and step inside your ship for the very first time and be met by a displeasing interior layout, which in most cases is not an easy fix, so a tour option within the shipbuilder would be fantastic. Blueprinting. 
Another simple and very handy addition to ships would be the ability to save a blueprint of a ship that you have built. In an ideal world, these blueprints could be shared between players, but I doubt such a system will ever be developed. Apart from that though, blueprinting will be very useful for anyone planning on doing New Game Plus. As you may or may not know, when you enter a New Game Plus, all of your character's credits, items, ships and outposts are deleted. So adding a blueprint feature for both the ship builder and for outposts would allow New Game Plus players to easily recreate their ships and outposts that they have spent tens of hours thoughtfully creating. As it stands currently, all of these creations are lost in New Game Plus and that's a real damn shame. Shame that could easily be prevented with the very simple addition of a blueprinting feature. Purchasing Ship Parts Following this, I wish there was a way to gain access to all of the ship parts in-game at one single location. As it stands, most ship technicians sell some high-end ship parts that cannot be acquired any other way. This actually makes utilizing all of these special ship parts almost impossible because a ship must be finalized and flyable before you can exit the ship builder. So you need to finish your ship before you can travel to the next ship technician to get the next ship part that you need for the ship that you're trying to currently build. But you can't actually get there without finalizing the ship first, even though it's not finished. Yeah, it's really clunky, silly, and seems to be the dictionary definition of a kerfuffle come to life. Let's just imagine that you want to build a table and you have to go to three different hardware stores to get the wood, the nails, and the varnish that you need. You go to the first one and buy the wood, but you can't leave the first one until you finish building the table. But you haven't got the nails or the varnish from the other two stores yet. So you got to build an inferior table, then take it to the second place and pull the nails out and then put the good nails in that you want and then varnish it and then take it to the third place and then take the varnish off and put the varnish on that you actually wanted in the first place. It's really stupid. One fix for this is to make ship parts purchasable just like any other item in the game. You buy them and they go into some kind of inventory of yours. This way you can just go to all of the ship technicians that you need to, buy the parts you need and go back to one location to fully assemble the ship once and be done with it. Traversal. Now let's move on to some traversal tweaks and additions that I think would improve exploration in Starfield. Firstly would be the addition of underwater exploration. It's something that has been in every Bethesda Game Studios game since Morrowind at least, but for some reason Bethesda Game Studios removed it from their, and I quote, most ambitious project to date. Well, if Starfield is so ambitious, can I submerge my character and partake in hand to flip a combat with the many aquatic aliens? And before anyone says underwater combat is unrealistic, as an Australian, I have had a few hand to hand combat scuffles with sea life in my time. I wouldn't suggest it, but it is realistic. Following this is a small gripe, which is the zoology perk allows you to harvest resources from creatures without killing them. You simply just go up to them, click A, and you get resources from them. That's fine, that's cool. However, this does not work on creatures within the water. Obviously, I would like this to be fixed slash changed so that I can choose those chasm bass. Coastal landings. Now, speaking of oceans, landing your ship at a coastal region on a planet is more difficult than it needs to be. Selecting any specific spot to land should not require multiple attempts at clicking an exact tiny pixel before it registers. A simple increase to the size of what the game considers to be a coastal region on a planet map would fix this poorly tuned zoning. Fast boosting. Now let's move back to the landlubber's chosen path, that being land. On PC, with a keyboard and mouse specifically, you can rebind the alternative key binding for jumping, which will unlock a hidden ability to boost pack forwards at a much faster speed compared to normal. This is fantastic. 
but it is not a feature that the game tells you exists and you can't do this on controller. So if you're on PC with a controller or if you're on console, sorry. So I think it's only fair that this is made available to those using a controller or just replace the normal boost pack speed with this faster ability. Or perhaps you can make faster boost packing something that is gained passively with the ranks of the boost packing skill. As if there is one common gripe in regards to exploration in Starfield, it is the lack of player speed. So this is the perfect solution and already in game. It just needs to be made easily accessible to all. Drivable vehicles. Building off of the previous points, many players would love a way to get around the surface of planets in a more timely manner. It would be great to see the introduction of some form of drivable land vehicle, car, motorbike, Star Wars speeder, dune buggy, unicycle, I don't think players would really mind as to what shape it takes as long as it exists. And while I agree this would be nice, I am certain that there is an in-game engine limitation preventing vehicles from being added. As I remember in Skyrim, they had to tune down the speed at which horses ran because there was a point where the speed at which the horse ran was actually faster than the game world could load. So with that in mind, again, I'm fairly certain that there is an in-game engine limitation preventing land vehicles. So I wouldn't expect this to be implemented anytime soon or at all. But another way to fix this somewhat would be to have a way to increase your character's running speed. Even if it's only 5, 10, 15, 20%, that will still save us 20% of the time we would have used running between locations or something like that. So whether it be tied to a skill or whatnot, again, I don't really care what form it takes. I would just love the ability to move faster in game. Points of interest. Now, following on from the previous topics of traversal things, let's move on to what we are actually traversing to, the points of interest. Now, I will say that Starfield's infinite nature, procedural systems and generated locations is the worst design decision made for the game. When this was revealed in the showcase, my stomach dropped. Our system builds a planet as the player approaches it. So even if your friends were to visit the same planet that you had, you would have a different story to tell. Wait, why? I don't like that. I don't like that at all. The system builds the planet as the player approaches it. So it's randomly generated every time. Hey, you want to find this cool thing? Go here on this planet. Oh, you no one else can because it was a random one in 10 billion chance that it happened in my game. <sighs> it's too random. It's like gambling, hoping for the thing you want. Yeah, that's not good. I could see no way in which this would be good or superior to what we had in previous BGS games. And I really wanted to be wrong and rather annoyingly, I was not. I personally hate it. I find it soulless. But that's not constructive, so let's explore possible ways to bandage this blunder. The two main issues that players have with the points of interest within Starfield are the distances between them are too vast and featureless to provide any form of meaningful gameplay. It might look realistic, it might feel realistic in scale and scope, but it's not fun. Running for three, four, five minutes in a straight line across a barren planet to reach the next remotely interesting thing, which inevitably turns out to be yet another carbon copy of a location that you've fully cleared eight times on other planets already. This just doesn't work. The Witcher 3 developers pinpointed the Goldilocks period between points of interest, and that was 40 seconds. The design philosophy of the 40 second rule. This meant that a player should not be able to run through the world for more than 40 seconds without running across something of interest. Now let's not beat around the bush here but the mind-numbing walking distances in Starfield between points of interest really does make you realize that the Witcher 3 developers were spot on. 
40 seconds is indeed the answer. Good job, Poland. Now for me, exploration in BGS games has always been about the things between the marked locations. As the marked locations, they're marked, you know they're there, but the stuff you find between them, that's what's special. So Starfield seems to be the physical incarnation of the antithesis of what makes exploration special. The only things to be found are the things that are already marked on the compass. And even those things are locations that you have already found multiple times before. Unfortunately, Starfield's procedural nature makes resolving these flaws difficult. But there are some ways it could be improved. I don't know if these will be easily implemented or if they are impossible requests, but they are the only potential solutions I can think of. So firstly, make points of interest spawn two to three times closer together and bring those run times down preferably to less than a minute. On top of this, they could also add what will likely have to be in the ballpark of hundreds of small unmarked locations to run across between the bigger marked points of interests. This will fill those long run times with little treats along the way. Now, if the current system is to be kept, there must be some measures taken to ensure that players don't feel like the points of interests that they are encountering are repeating. An obvious solution would be to make many, many times more points of interest. That way, by the time you run across something you've already found, well, you've forgotten about it because it was 300 hours ago. Another band-aid would be adding the points of interest to a rotating roster. So once a point of interest spawns and you go and explore it, it goes to the end of the list of all possible points of interest. So this ensures that every other possible point of interest will appear before that first point of interest is generated again in that playthrough. So that we the players are guaranteed to see the complete maximum array of variety before things start repeating. As it sits, Starfield casts an illusion of exploration and discovery, providing randomly generated points of interest, usually large building complexes that sadly, they can't add anything to the world building or the story of Starfield as a whole. In Skyrim, you could find a tiny little cabin with not much to offer. But this cabin has a literal place within the world of Skyrim. You can trace other strange stories and mysteries back to the cabin because of its literal place. Its actual physical location is concrete in the lore and the world. Specific pre-planned positions give everything meaning. Sadly, in Starfield, none of these randomly placed locations have meaning or can have meaning. Go into a cave, find a dead guy in the cave. All right, he's got a note on him. Cool. An hour later, you go into a cave. Oh, it's the exact same cave with the exact same dead guy with the exact same note. Suddenly, that illusion of meaning and discovery, it just evaporates. It's done. It's over. It's fruitless. Pointless. And as we discussed on top of this, between these large point of interest locations is absolutely nothing. Not only nothing, but many minutes of running in a straight line of nothing. So Starfield's exploration is very macro, large locations, large distances. But the magic of exploration is in the micro. The wonder of discovery is the things to be discovered between the marked locations. Perfection is lots of little things done very well. Starfield has a bunch of big things done okay that repeat over and over. It's kind of like a moving panorama. You know those things they used to use in old cinema? You'd have a side shot of a car and a looping panorama behind the car, moving to give the illusion that the car is moving when it's actually just a piece of cloth with the same picture painted on it, whizzing past, repeating endlessly, designed to create, or at least attempt to create, the illusion of something specific and special within what is actually an infinite, randomly generated matrix. Well, if we're going to create illusions, we will need like 10 times the current points of interest with thousands of small unmarked bits and pieces to find between them. I understand this is a huge undertaking and not an overnight fix, and probably not a fix that will ever be fixed at all, but repairing Starfield's exploration 
I feel like it must be done, and I can't think of any simpler ways to do so. Radiant Quests Now in a similar situation as the points of interest are the Radiant Quests that one can run across while wandering the wildernesses of Starfield's 1600 or so moons and planets. The only way I can see these improving is to have more variants. As I can think of three Radiant Quests that I've encountered in Starfield. Like that's it, I can literally only think of three. But the worrying part is I can remember encountering all three of these Radiant Quests multiple times, over and over. The same NPC asking me to do the same thing again and again. And they're never fun tasks and they're not rewarding either. It's like a lazy Susan at a Chinese restaurant just spinning the same three stale prawn crackers past me over and over again and again. So much like the points of interest, there either needs to be much more variety or a rotating roster like we suggested for the points of interest to ensure that the player experiences the maximum amount of variety before seeing any repeat content. NPCs now let's move on to some general NPC tweaks that would be much appreciated. Firstly, the nameless randomly generated citizens all look unnatural. Who would have guessed bad product and randomly generated once again, like peas in a pod. But seriously, they remind me of the aliens in shoddy human disguises from Men in Black. They all look like Arnie when he's shot out onto the surface of Mars. I don't know what it is, but all of the named characters look pretty good, like a human actually created them. Then there is a distinct and very obvious downgrade in any care to make the nameless NPCs look remotely human. Why are all of their faces so ridiculous? They have insane hairstyles and outfits, none of which match. They make Drekius from Redguard look desirable. Why do they all have double chins and why are all of their eyes bulging out of their heads? I feel like I'm in H.P. Lovecraft's Shadow of Innsmouth. Now a fix for these weird NPCs would be to get any number of developers to handcraft a few hundred characters to be used as nameless NPCs. I mean, they could do it in one afternoon and just say, everyone, for this entire hour, we're all going to make one NPC each. And with 400 devs, in one hour, you've got 400 brand new, handcrafted, normal looking NPCs to be used as just these random citizens. And then we could be rid of whatever body snatching invasion force we're currently surrounded by in the cities. Companions. While on the topic of NPCs, companions in the game, or more specifically the romanceable, more in-depth companions, all have the exact same moral compass. While there are a couple of romanceable companions to choose from, they all have the exact same ethics. If you want to be a pirate or a murderer or a drug dealer, well, there is no companion for you to have by your side in this as all of the current romanceable companions will all just scoff and be disgusted and leave. This means that the available romanceable companions actually end up influencing how the player plays. It's like a virtual school teacher ready to slap you on the wrist if you dare laugh in class. I'm playing a game. I want to express moments of madness from time to time, but I know if I do something insane for five seconds, it will be throwing away the last 10 hours of trying to make Sarah Morgan happy out the window. As she'll go, oh my god, how could you? That's abhorrent. I'm leaving. Blah, 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 me, 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 me. It's like, why am I being nagged in a video game? That's not fun. I mean, at the very least, they could add in like a Harley Quinn kind of energy pirate companion who is joy filled when we randomly murder or rob some innocent spacefarers. More in-depth, reactive companions is a great idea and a great addition. We just need some different personality types mixed in there. Money. Starfield has a pretty decent economy that works perfectly at low levels. However, as your character progresses in level, the items you loot while journeying the galaxy slowly increase in average value. This slow increase is not paralleled by an increase in available vendor credits. 
This can become quite frustrating as suddenly you can only offload one weapon in exchange for a merchant's entire trading funds, which leads to having to wait 24 hours in game, which as we know is a taxing endeavor and should be avoided at all costs. So how do we solve this? Well, the answer is once again, Skyrim, specifically perks from the speech skill tree that I feel would not only fit straight into Starfield, but are much needed to spruce up the progressionless mercantile's journey. Perks such as merchant. You can sell any type of item to any kind of merchant. Investor can invest 500 gold with a shopkeeper to increase their available gold permanently. Master trader. Every merchant in the world gains 1000 gold for bartering. If some of these skills slash perks would be rolled into Starfield like this, I think the whole in-game economy could be pulled up to a much more appropriate level for mid-game and even end-game characters. Transmogrification. So now we'll move on to some more miscellaneous topics. Firstly, something a lot of people seem to want, I never really thought of it, but that is a transmog system, which if you are unfamiliar with that, it's a system in which you can collect item appearances and then apply item appearances that you've collected to whatever armor you are wearing. So let's just say that your really good armor looks really ugly. Well, with a transmog system, you can keep wearing your good ugly armor, but give it the appearance of a different piece of armor. So it's got the stats you want, but it also looks how you want, provided you've collected that piece. Now, transmog features are much more common in MMOs, my only experience being in World of Warcraft and the Elder Scrolls Online. And let me tell you, there are plenty of players in both who dedicate a whole lot of time and energy to the transmog systems. So I cannot see any downsides to adding a transmogrification system into Starfield. It would only serve to broaden the player's ability to customize their character as so they please. It is definitely not vital, but something I think every player would welcome and utilize. Not only that, but this would once again add the whole sticker book element to the game, compelling players to truly get out there and collect all of the different item appearances to fill up once again their sticker book. Active Effects now, I do personally like some numbers. I'm a bit of a numerophile. Not only that, but I like numbers that clarify things, which means in video games, I like to know the numerical goings-ons of my character, which means character stats. For this reason, I would appreciate if some form of active effects information page was added for our characters. And while there is a character status page, there is only a tracking of ailments and a number of tabs fittingly keeping tabs on what your character's been up to, like how many planets you've scanned, how many animals you've killed, the most credits you've held, etc, etc. And this information is all well and good, but it is useless. And that's fine, but why give us pages of useless stats while at the same time not providing players with a page of useful stats? like current bonuses, buffs, active effects, magazine boosts, skill level enhancements, and so on and so forth. I would love to see a status page showing how powerful my character is in plain, accurate, numerical form. I've recently been playing Halls of Torment, and at any time you can look at your character's stats and how many active abilities and bonuses you have, damage output, DPS, crit chance, range, all the things everything you could ever want, everything you could ever need. Well, I would love to see these kind of important character stats available in Starfield in plain and accurate numerical form. Skill clarification. Speaking of lack of clarity, the specific effects of skills needs to be clarified, once again numerically. Most skills tell you exactly what they do in terms of numbers. For example, the first rank of Ballistic skill. Ballistic weapons do 10% more damage. Okay, good. I know what that means. But then we look at something like Cellular Regeneration, and it has all these things that say adds a chance. What's a chance? What number is a chance? Is it 1%? 90%? 0.000? 
zero 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 one percent i mean all of those are chances but all of those are very very different so these numerical clarifications are important because if a player has one skill point but we need to decide between two skills to invest in where do we put it in a clearly stated 10 percent damage boost or in a skill that just says a chance well we need to know what a chance means to make that decision accurately so I would love if instead of a chance, we were provided numerical clarity on everything, especially if we're going to play the game for hours and hours to try and level up to get one skill point, And then the skill we're putting it in just says a chance. I don't know what that means. And to go along with that, let's just talk about skills really quickly. Something else that needs to be fixed pronto is all of the skills that either don't work, don't do what they say or are useless. We won't go through all of them or we'll be here all day, but there are a number of skills that simply do not work as they should. So Bethesda, please fix those. And before we move on from skill points, I would love to have the ability to redistribute skill points, perhaps at a cost. I don't really mind how it's implemented as long as it is implemented. For the reasons we just spoke about, I have often dedicated a skill point to something only to discover that it's garbage or it's completely broken so some kind of system of undoing a skill point dedication would be greatly appreciated rebalancing experience now something i've felt has needed addressing since my first hour in starfield is a major rebalancing of how experience is distributed to the player for example i spend five minutes painstakingly battling a master level lock and when i finally get it open i receive 20 experience but if i go and shoot some alien in the head and kill it instantly well would you look at that 100 experience for one second's work and then on the flip side you spend an hour doing a quest which upon completion you get 200 experience which is the same amount of experience I could have received by shooting two aliens in the head in the span of about, what, five seconds? So it seems the longer something takes and the harder it is, the lower the experience you will receive. Obviously, this is broken and needs some very thorough retuning. And while we are talking about experience, the XP gain notification pops up just below the center of the screen. This is not good. As the crosshairs, the center of the screen, is the most important part of the HUD, the heads up display, to always keep clear so the player can see. So it would be a great idea to move the XP notification to any location that is nowhere near the center of the screen. Kill cams. Now something less important, but something I think every player misses, would be the Bethesda trademark classic, the kill cams. Where did they go? Fallout 3 had them, Skyrim had them, Fallout 4 had them, and here we get Starfield, which does not have them. Again, these are not integral to the game functioning, but it's another fan favorite feature that's mysteriously absent from Starfield. Cutscene Remover. Now, I don't know if this option is possible, but by the gods, I hope it is. I would love it if we could disable all cutscenes slash animations that don't do anything but waste time. Sitting down in a chair is slow. Standing up from a chair is slow. Docking in space is slow. Undocking in space is slow. Ships landing is slow ships taking off is slow hopping into your pilot seat is slow getting up from your pilot seat is once again slow waiting for airlock doors to cycle unlock open close lock cycle unlock open it's slow now i don't know if any of these animations slash cutscenes are actually loading screens in disguise and therefore cannot be turned off but if there are any of these pesky time wasting mini nothings that can be turned off please get rid of them or at least give us the option to toggle them off by themselves eh who really cares but after hundreds of hours sitting through these over and over it feels like death by a thousand cuts factions 
And finally, I want to talk about factions, or the lack thereof. And I know this is something that is not a realistic or quick fix for Starfield. And as I mentioned at the start of the video, this will very much devolve into something more akin to a rant than I would like. But I care, and I'm saddened by the true lack of scope in Starfield's game universe. BGS, as I've mentioned a couple of times, has a strange problem. Not unique to them, but a problem nonetheless. The bigger they get as a company, the more time they get, the more funding they get, the more devs they get, the more experience they get, the more external support they get, the wider, yet more shallow their products become. Now I spent an entire day or two collecting a whole bunch of data and by hand manually counting and listing some important numbers that I'll now share with you. And perhaps you will be as shocked as I was. So, in the base game of Starfield, excluding the main quests, there are four joinable faction quest lines. The Crimson Fleet slash UC System Defense has nine quests. Now I'm counting this as one quest line as regardless of which side you choose, the quests are actually the same quests. Then we have the Freestar Rangers, they have 8 quests. We have Ryujin Industries, they have 13 quests. And we have the United Colonies, they have 9 quests. So in terms of faction quests in Starfield, there are 39 faction quests. Now in the base game, the vanilla version of the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind, there are, excluding the main quests, just as we did in Starfield, there are 10 major joinable faction quest lines with a smattering of other smaller faction quest lines. There is the Fighters Guild, which has 31 quests. The Imperial Cult has 25 quests. The Imperial Legion has 19 quests. The Mages Guild has 33 quests. The Morag Tong has 25 quests. The Thieves Guild has 30 quests. The Tribunal Temple has 23 quests, House Hlalu has 31 quests, House Redoran has 36 quests, and House Talvani has 29 quests. That's 282 quests just in major joinable factions. Then there is another 29 faction quests in the minor factions. The Ashlander Tribes have four quests. The Census and Excise Office has one quest. The Twin Lamps has three quests. The Daedric quests are seven quests. There are eight vampire quests. And then there are three vampire clans, each of which has two quests unique to it. So in total, in the base game of Morrowind, there are 311 faction quests. Now you cannot do all of them in one playthrough, but you can do most of them. And the quest lines that you didn't get to complete in a particular playthrough are there for another playthrough. So Morrowind has 311 faction quests available, and Starfield has 39 faction quests available. Already we can see a pretty damn big problem here. So now let's look at the developers for each game. Before we do, I think it is important to clarify that I have manually gone through the entire credits for both games. Morrowind wasn't so much of an issue, but Starfield has over 4,000 people credited on it. But I've gone through both of these and only included developers actually making the game because that's what we need to look at. So I have excluded, you know, voice actors, musicians, corporate roles, marketing roles, PR roles, office staff, special thanks, things like that. And while these obviously all play an important part in a game's creation overall, what we just want to look at are the men and the women who built these actual video games with their actual hands and minds. I have also manually placed every single dev into a spreadsheet so that if a developer is credited multiple times on a single game, they are only counted once as they are a single person. So with that said, the base game of The Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind has 53 credited game developers from Bethesda Game Studios. That's it. Starfield has 386 credited developers from Bethesda Game Studios and 715 
credited game developers from external studios and companies. So collectively, Starfield has over 1,100 credited game developers that worked on the game. So now let's combine all this information we've got so far. Base game of Morrowind, 53 developers, 311 faction quests. Starfield, 1,101 developers, 39 faction quests. So Starfield has 20 times the developers while simultaneously producing one eighth of the faction quests. And may I also clarify that in my opinion, Morrowind's quest lines were really good. So not only is the pool much bigger, but it's much deeper too. So if we average these numbers out to get some fractions to do with dev power to faction quest ratios, well, 311 faction quests in Morrowind divided by 53 developers, on average, that's 5.87 faction quests per developer. And then if we take Starfield's 39 faction quests and divide it by the 1,101 developers, we get an average of 0.03 faction quests per dev. If we take Morrowind's 5.87 faction quests per dev and divide it by Starfield's 0.035 faction quests per dev, we get a number which is 167.7. For clarity's sake, let's just make it 160. So this means on average, every Morrowind developer contributed 160 times more to faction quests than every Starfield developer did. Now, of course, not every developer worked on quests and implementing quests in a text based game such as Morrowind would be easier than implementing quests in Starfield. However, text based or not, good writing is good writing. Deep content is deep content. There is no amount of explaining away that will ever, ever sanely justify 53 Morrowind developers cooking up 311 faction quests and 1101 starfield developers cooking up 39 faction quests the ratio of dev power to faction quests from morrowind to starfield is 160 to 1. even if we say that making quests for starfield is twice as hard as it was in morrowind that would still leave us at a ratio of 80 to 1 maybe four times harder, that's still 40 to one. 10 times harder, that is still 16 to one. 16 to one is not even close. These numbers are mind boggling and extremely sobering. I mean, these aren't even my opinions. This is just numerical data. So with that out of the way, um, where are all of the factions? We've got 1600 planets and four joinable factions. The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind is set on the island of Vardenfell, which is a region within the province of Morrowind, which is part of the continent of Tamriel, one of many found on the planet Nern. Yet, this region of a province of a continent of a planet has almost 10 times the faction content compared to Starfield. Starfield should have 30, 40, 50 factions, all with quest lines, even if they are small, like the Bard's College in Skyrim. Like if we had to choose between one of three mining corporations, or search the galaxy looking for old books for the Archiving Society, or go and scan all the creatures in game for the fauna researchers, collect old earth artifacts for the Historical Heritage Foundation, the Mechanists, who are secretly building a giant Gundam robot from the now illegal AI tech parts and mech schematics from the Narian Wars, or we could uncover things for the Geologist Guild by finding all of the natural traits in the game. Just random things like this. A shipbuilder's union, a questline based around building ships. Maybe they take orders and you have to build ships that fit certain parameters for the customer. Hey, do you love exploring planets and scanning all of the flora? Cool, because there's a faction of botanists. Even something like the zoo in Aquila City. I thought there was going to be a quest line based on finding and capturing specific creatures for the zoo. That would have been cool. It would have been silly, but it would have been fun. Or even the religions in game. Why are they not joinable? Why do they not have quest lines? As is, they serve no purpose at all. Or list. Why can't I join list and have a quest line based on building outposts for people to settle? 
What is the problem here? Starfield, the canvas is set, but so little has been painted onto it. In my mind, as Bethesda Game Studios grows in size, funding, support and experience, the majesty and brilliance of their well design and writing, it should get bigger and better with every release. Instead, it's dwindling into meek darkness. I don't want to have to look back and remember the good days when BGS released Game of the Year back to back to back to back, which they did. I want that now, and I'm sure you do too, and I am most certain that Bethesda Game Studios wants that as well. So what is the problem? Why does it feel like I know what makes a good BGS game more than BGS itself? Well, with this in mind, guess how many writers within Bethesda Game Studios are credited on Starfield? Well, within Bethesda Game Studios, there is Emil as the lead writer, and um... Oh, yeah, that's literally it. That is it. There is a second credited writer from outside of Bethesda Game Studios. There are 10 quest designers from BGS credited, which yes, while you did make some cool quests, obviously that number is not enough. So 10 quest designers and two writers. I don't think it's out of place of me to suggest that Bethesda Game Studios hire 50 writers and 50 quest designers. Give me too much to do. Overwhelm me with the crazy amount of writing and content that matters. There are hundreds of game developers dedicated to 3D modeling credited on Starfield from outside of Bethesda Game Studios. Literally hundreds of them. But we have one internal writer. Now I'm not discrediting Emil's work, but it's like hiring one bricklayer to build a pyramid. The Witcher 3 has 24 credited writers, and it shows. Baldur's Gate 3 has 20 credited writers, and it shows. I really don't know what to say, in the sense that I do know what to say, but it seems so obvious that it isn't worth saying, but I'll say it anyway. Why don't you just hire 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 writers and put them to work? Because at the moment, if Starfield were a 1000 page book, only five of those pages have anything written on them currently. This is the Skyrim pizza. All of the content in the game is the topping. There is the right amount of topping for the size of the pizza. But then we get to Starfield's pizza. Well, this is the topping. It might be the same amount of topping as Skyrim. It might be more than Skyrim. I don't know. But the problem is the pizza base is astronomical. The only good part of the pizza, the only part of the pizza that anyone wants is the part with the topping, the part with the handcrafted content, which leads us to a tricky problem with Starfield. As you start the game in the middle of the topping, you spend the first 50, 100, 200 hours playing through the parts of Starfield that have the topping on it, and you like it. It's the handcrafted stuff that you know and love from Bethesda Game Studios. But then, 300, 400 hours in, and you've run out of topping, and you realize the perceived delicious galactic pizza is actually a featureless, tasteless, soulless, flavorless, barren, galaxy-sized pizza base. And this is my theory as to why so many people loved Starfield in the first few weeks of them playing it, but as time has passed, the reviews are tanking, people have just stopped playing it. And that's because they got through all the bits with the pizza topping, and now they just have the plain base and go, eh, I'll play something else. Now, ultimately, I don't know of a realistic solution for this apart from make enough topping to cover the pizza or make the pizza fit the topping. But I can't see Bethesda doing either of these. They are not realistic, implementable fixes. One requires them to produce 1,000 times the content that they've been able to produce in five years, and the other requires them to remove 98% of the planets in the game. As I said, I don't see either of those things happening. Regardless of this, I think it can be agreed that Bethesda Game Studios needs to seriously bolster their writing staff. Again, nothing against the current writing staff, there simply just isn't enough of them. 
And if they bolster their writing staff and do unique items correctly, well, I think finally Bethesda Game Studios will be able to do their own games some justice. Ah, oh, but with that sobering rant complete and every single realistic change for Starfield that myself and my community can think of, I am very interested to hear your thoughts on the ideas proposed in this video. And I'm very keen for you to let me know of any other fixes for Starfield that you can think of. And also, what are your gripes with the game in its current state? Perhaps together we can forge an elegant solution. So leave your suggestions down below in the comments section so that myself, the community, and hopefully Bethesda Game Studios can take them on board and make the appropriate changes to your feedback. I would like to thank you very much for watching. I've been Kamal, and I'll see you very shortly in the next video. I'll see you there soon.